On this episode of Black Girl Gone, I tell the story of Celia Huda, a 21-year-old woman who was murdered in Gainesville, Florida in December 2010. In the early morning hours of December 30th, a call came in reporting a brush fire in a wooded area near a road. When the fire was extinguished, a badly burned body was found. When the body is identified as belonging to the college cheerleader, detectives begin their search for the people involved in this brutal murder. And within weeks, they find their man and woman. This is Celia's story. When Celia Huda's parents moved to the U.S. when she was just a little girl, they had no idea the tragedy that would occur or the brutal way her promising life would end. Celia was born in Ghana on May 27, 1989, but when she was very young, her parents immigrated to the United States and settled in Gainesville, Florida. Moving to a new country can be a very difficult transition, and having children can make it even harder. But fortunately for the Huda family, they had family already living there, and they also found a large West African community in Gainesville. As a child, Celia attended P.K. Young Developmental Research School, a K-12 school that is a part of the University of Florida. The people who knew Celia described her as a joy to be around. Although small in size, Celia had a big personality that made the people around her just feel comfortable. As she got older, Celia developed a passion for many things, but the thing she perhaps was most passionate about was her love of dance. Her friends and family said that she would dance everywhere and anywhere, any chance she got. Her love of dance eventually led her to cheerleading. After graduating from high school, Celia began attending Santa Fe College, where she joined their cheer team. After graduating from Santa Fe, she enrolled in the University of Florida to complete her bachelor's degree. There, she was majoring in family, youth, and community services. And after graduation, she planned to go to nursing school. While at the University of Florida, Celia became an active member of the campus community, She continued her love of cheer by joining the competitive cheer club team at UF, and she also danced with the Urban Essence Dance Squad. By the fall of 2010, Celia, who was 21 years old, was getting ready to complete her senior year at UF and was looking forward to graduating. At that time, she was living in an apartment off campus, and friends said that aside from her love of dancing and cheering, Celia was also an animal lover. She had a dog named Vegas, who she adored, but she also had fish, a snake, and mice. Her friends said that she had a mini zoo in her apartment. By all accounts, Celia was a happy young woman who had a very bright future ahead of her. But there were things going on in her life that were causing issues in her otherwise unproblematic life. And those things would eventually lead to her brutal murder. In December 2010, Celia finished up the fall semester at UF and was getting ready for her last semester as an undergrad. She had recently begun dating a young man named Mike, and things seemed to be going well for the couple. On December 29, 2010, Celia visited her parents at home at around 6 p.m. According to her father, she had come to their house to pick up an insurance card. And everything seemed normal about her visit and her parents did not recall anything out of the ordinary about their daughter's behavior. But when she left their home that evening, it would be the last time that her parents ever saw her alive again. Shortly before 3 a.m. on December 30th, 2010, a woman and her daughter were driving on County Road 225 in Gainesville when they spotted a fire burning in the wooded area near the highway. They assumed that it was a simple brush fire, and so they called 911 to report it. When the fire department arrived, they began dousing the flames, but as the fire went out, firefighters discovered that this was not a brush fire. It was a burning body. Firefighters called police to the scene, and when they arrived, they were able to determine that the body they found was female, but she had been so badly burned, it was going to be difficult to identify her by simply looking at a photo. As they began to process the crime scene, it was obvious to police from the odor that gasoline had been used as an accelerant for this fire. 
There wasn't much evidence at the scene. However, police did recover a paper napkin and a broken cell phone case. They could also identify fragments of a blanket that the victim had been wrapped in. The evidence was collected, but before detectives could do anything, they needed to identify the victim. And so while detectives tried to identify their victim, family and friends of Celia had not spoken to her since that Wednesday, the 29th. Her father had tried to call her several times, but her phone was going straight to voicemail. Over the next two days, Celia's family and friends attempted to contact her, but no one had spoken to her and no one knew where she was. And after days went by with no contact from her, her parents decided that it was time to contact the Gainesville Police Department and report their daughter missing. Now, by Saturday, it had been two days since the body of a female was discovered burning in a wooded area. And although the body had been badly burned, Forensic was able to identify some of the tattoos that were on the body. And so, in the chance that the person they found had been arrested previously and had their tattoos recorded, detectives checked their database to see if they could find a match to their victim. And when the information was entered, it came back as a positive match to Celia Huda. According to reporting, in November 2010, Celia had been arrested for violating a restraining order, but it wasn't until later in this investigation that police realized how that arrest was ultimately connected to her murder. Now, after being able to identify their victim as 21-year-old Celia Huda, detectives also learned that shortly before she was identified, she had been reported missing by her family. Investigators called Celia's parents to deliver the devastating news. Her father told them that the last time he had seen his daughter was on the 29th when she came to his house, but that he had not spoken to her since. He said that he had been trying to call her, but her cell phone was going straight to voicemail. After speaking to Celia's father, detectives went over to her apartment to see if they could find evidence about what happened to her. They had also learned that Celia owned a 2001 silver Nissan that was missing. Once detectives arrived at the apartment, they found an eerily normal scene. There were no signs of forced entry, and there were no signs that a struggle had taken place inside her apartment. And the car she owned was not in the parking lot. And that led investigators to believe that Celia had either been lured away from her apartment or she had never made it back there. After speaking to a security guard at the apartment complex, detectives discovered that the building she lived in used a digital passcode system. Detectives asked if they could tell them about Celia's last time there and found out that she had left her apartment on the evening of December 29th, but she never returned. At that point, investigators could trace Celia's steps up until the point she left her parents' house. After that, she seemed to have vanished until her body was found hours later. Now, while at the apartment complex where she lived, detectives spoke to several of Celia's neighbors to see if they had seen her or heard anything that day that she was last seen. And none of her neighbors recalled seeing anything that day. However, one of the neighbors did mention to detectives that Celia had an ex-boyfriend that would often come over to her apartment and they could be heard arguing. The neighbor said that the ex was loud and he would often be heard yelling and screaming. The information about the ex was a possible angle for detectives to explore. And so they began their investigation by looking into the people that were closest to Celia. After her body was discovered, an autopsy was performed to determine how Celia had died. Because her body had been so badly burned, there was no way to tell by just looking at her what had happened. But the medical examiner determined the cause of death was homicidal violence of an undetermined type. Now, although the exact cause of death could not be determined, detectives knew that whatever happened to Celia was brutal and she had been doused in gasoline and set on fire so that there would be no evidence to connect her murder to a suspect. As word of Celia's murder spread throughout the UF campus and the Gainesville community, the people who knew Celia could not believe what was happening. 
She was loved by everyone, and no one could fathom how her life could come to such a violent end. But even more than that, no one could imagine who would want to kill her. As detectives looked deeper into Celia's life, they began to uncover more and more about what exactly had been happening in her life in the months and weeks leading up to her murder. After visiting the apartments where she lived, investigators got a call from Mike, the man that Celia was currently dating. He spoke to detectives and told them that he had been with Celia on Monday and Tuesday that week, but that he last saw her in the early evening on Wednesday, the 29th, when she left him to go run some errands. After that, he never spoke to Celia again. He said that in the hours after he last saw her, he tried to call her several times, but her phone was going straight to voicemail. But he said that around 1.45 a.m. on the 30th, he again tried to call her phone, but again, it went straight to voicemail. However, he tried to call right back, and this time, when he called, a woman who wasn't Celia answered the phone and told him that Celia was asleep and that she would call him back later. She, of course, never called Mike back, and less than an hour later, Celia's body was found. Mike told detectives that he and Celia had only been dating for about a month, and so they asked him about what they had been told by Celia's neighbor about her ex. Mike told them that he was not the man that her neighbors were referring to, and that Celia's ex was a man that he only knew by his initials, A.D. After speaking to Mike, who had been cooperative, investigators wanted to identify and speak with A.D. immediately. And fortunately for detectives, they wouldn't have to wait long because A.D. came right to them when he showed up to Celia's apartment asking how he could help. In the days following Celia's murder, investigators had been following a trail of information that had led to a potential suspect, but they were going to need way more information if they were going to link anyone to this murder. When the pieces of the truth began to reveal themselves, it wouldn't take police long to find the people responsible for this murder. In the early morning hours of December 30th, 2010, the badly burned body of 21-year-old Celia Huda was found in Gainesville, Florida. As the investigation into her murder deepened, Detectives began to narrow in on not only one, but two suspects. After Celia's body was found, detectives working on the case had spoken to several people, including neighbors, friends, and her current boyfriend. They learned from neighbors that an ex of Celia's was still coming around, and they would often hear them arguing, and it was clear to them that the ex was the aggressor. As luck would have it, the 24-year-old man, whose full name was Antonio Drayton, showed up at Celia's apartment while investigators were at the scene. Antonio was brought in for questioning, and he told police that Celia had been ignoring him for weeks, but that on the 29th, she texted him asking if she could come over to his house. But he said she never came, and he never spoke to her again. Detectives knew that Antonio was the aggressive ex that had been overheard by neighbors, but as they took a closer look, they discovered that on at least two occasions, these fights had turned violent. In January 2010, Antonio, according to reports, allegedly chased Celia through a parking lot and pulled her hair. In June 2010, police were called to Celia's apartment after it's alleged that Antonio had broken into her apartment, beat her up, choked her, and then robbed her. However, according to reporting, the charges had been dropped, and Antonio claimed that he was drunk at the time of the attack. But Antonio had a long arrest record and a history of being violent with women. It was hard to understand how a young woman like Celia, with such a bright future, ever got involved with someone like Antonio in the first place. Detectives were becoming more and more suspicious that Antonio may be involved, but they had no evidence at that moment to connect him. Besides, according to him, he was seeing someone else, a 42-year-old woman named Cassandra, 
And in fact, he said that he was with her the night of the 29th. He said that after Celia didn't show up, he spent the evening with his girlfriend watching movies. Detectives also spoke to Cassandra to confirm his story. And Cassandra signed a sworn statement corroborating what Antonio told them. After having made contact with both Celia's current and ex-boyfriend, detectives had only been able to rule out one of them. But as the investigation continued, there was another angle that had yet to be explored, and that was regarding the restraining order that had been taken against Celia that had ultimately led to her arrest in November 2010. In October of that year, a woman named Angela had taken out a restraining order against Celia, Angela reported that she and Celia had gotten into a physical altercation and that afterwards, Celia had allegedly sent her threatening text messages. But how did these two women know each other? Well, they were both involved with Antonio Drayton. And in November 2010, according to reporting, Celia was arrested for violating the restraining order when she showed up at Antonio's house and encountered Angela. After learning about Angela and Celia's ongoing issues, detectives wanted to speak to her. Maybe this was a love triangle going wrong. And when detectives brought Angela in for questioning, they learned that despite the restraining order that was still in place, Angela and Celia had met up just four days before she was murdered. But it wasn't what detectives assumed. Angela said that they didn't meet up to fight or argue. They had a conversation, what she described as a heart-to-heart. -heart. Both women had finally realized that Antonio was the issue, and he had been lying to both of them. Angela said that she met Antonio at a club and that she knew about Cassandra. However, she didn't think that they were in a relationship. The way Antonio described it, Cassandra was taking care of him a sugar mama, so to speak. Angela was cooperative and was able to give detectives an alibi, and so she was ruled out as a suspect. Investigators had explored other angles, but they always led back to Antonio. Celia had dated Antonio on and off for two years, but she ended their relationship after realizing his true colors. However, even after the official breakup, they continued to spend time together, but they would often get into fights. Friends of Celia said that she had been trying to get away from the relationship. She had started seeing someone else, but Antonio was still coming around. The biggest missing piece of this mystery was Celia's missing 2001 silver Nissan. In the days following her murder, detectives had been trying to locate the vehicle, and on January 3, 2011, Celia's car was found in the parking lot of the Turtle Creek Apartments in Gainesville. When the car was found, detectives immediately noticed a strong smell of gasoline coming from the back of the car. When they popped the trunk, they found pillowcases matching the comforter that Celia's body was wrapped in. In the front seat, they found Celia's purse and wallet. Finding her purse and wallet in her car gave credence to the theory that whatever happened to Celia happened after she left her parents' house on the 29th and that she had never made it back to her apartment. Finding the car was a huge break for this case, and the location of the car was helping detectives to narrow in on their suspect because the apartments where the car was found was within walking distance of where Antonio lived. Investigators were getting closer and closer to being able to arrest the suspect, but they still needed more evidence. One thing they knew for sure about Celia's murder was that gasoline was used as an accelerant. It was on the body and soaked into the floor of her car. In an attempt to see if they could obtain surveillance footage of Celia's car being driven by their suspect to a gas station, Detectives visited every gas station between where Celia's car was found and where her body was discovered. And finally, after visiting several gas stations on and around the route, detectives finally located surveillance footage of Celia's car at a gas station in a nearby town of Stark, Florida. Now, Stark, not so coincidentally, 
was the town where Antonio's foster family lived. When detectives review the footage, they are surprised when they see who is seen getting out of Celia's car. It wasn't Antonio. It was Cassandra, his girlfriend and supposed alibi. Cassandra is seen getting out of the driver's side of the car and entering the gas station where she buys $2 worth of gas that she puts into a can. After identifying the woman on the footage, detectives then went to speak to Antonio's foster family to see if they could offer some insight into the situation. Detectives spoke to Antonio's brother, who told them that he had randomly shown up at their house at around 11 p.m. on December 29th. He said Antonio was acting anxious and asked him if he could borrow some money. A neighbor of his family told detectives that they saw a car matching Celia's leaving the driveway of that home the night of the 29th, and they said that there was a cheerleading sticker in the window. Up until that point, detectives had not suspected that Cassandra was involved, but after getting the surveillance footage, they knew that she was involved. They just didn't know to what extent. But they knew they needed to bring her in as soon as possible, especially once they discovered that she may be trying to make a run for it. On January 24th, 2011, investigators learned that Cassandra had gotten a new driver's license with a new legal name, a different date of birth, an incomplete address, and a six-inch height difference. Fortunately, police were able to track her down before she left, and she was brought in for questioning. When Cassandra was confronted about her involvement in Celia's murder, she denied that she had anything to do with what happened. She stuck to her story and insisted that her and Antonio were home watching movies when Celia was murdered. But detectives did not believe her. They knew she was lying. They had surveillance footage of her driving the victim's car, and yet she had no explanation for that. However, detectives were going to get all the evidence they would need to arrest both her and Antonio. And while the detectives continued questioning Cassandra, DNA results came back from the napkin found at the crime scene, and it came back as a positive match to Antonio Drayton. Between that DNA evidence and the cell phone records from both he and Cassandra's phones the night of the murder, detectives had enough evidence to arrest both Cassandra Kimbrough and Antonio Drayton. After Antonio's arrest, he tried to pin the murder solely on Cassandra, telling detectives that she had strangled Celia to death with a bell and that she had poured gasoline on Celia's body and he watched as she lit her on fire. Now, although detectives were sure that Cassandra was involved, they knew that she had not killed Celia alone, and so they confronted her with the story that Antonio told them. And Cassandra finally decided to tell the truth. She told detectives that Celia had gone over to Antonio's house to break things off with him for good, but Antonio got angry and attacked Celia, strangling her to death. After she was dead, he called Cassandra to help him get rid of the body. She said they took Celia's car and drove around for a while with her body in the trunk, trying to figure out what to do before he decided to dump Celia's body and set her on fire. Cassandra pled guilty and received a plea deal after agreeing to testify against Antonio. Antonio initially pled not guilty, but eventually changed his plea to guilty in exchange for a 45-year sentence. For her role, Cassandra received a two-year prison sentence and was released in 2012. Antonio remains in a Florida state prison where he is serving out the remainder of his sentence. It's hard to understand the reasons behind this murder. Antonio was dating multiple women, one of whom was allegedly taking care of him and paying all his bills. Yet, he was so possessive over Celia that instead of just letting it be over, he decided to kill her. Celia had so much life to live, and a loser like Antonio came into her life, abused her, 
And then when she finally got the strength to be done with him, he murdered her. There are many lessons that can be learned from Celia's story, but at the core of the story is the brutal, senseless murder of a college cheerleader who was just beginning her life. Celia deserved to live, to dance, to cheer, to graduate, to be everything that she dreamed of being. But sadly, evil came in and stole all of that potential from her and the people who knew and loved her. I pray that the people closest to her have been able to find some sense of peace in the darkness of this tragedy. May Celia Huda rest in peace. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, and Threads. <laughs>